Uh, good morning, friends. Uh, welcome to this uh, National Symposium on uh, Practice Management. I think one of the very, very important uh, subjects to be discussed. And uh, my job is to talk something on the policies the government makes for eye health because we know that the health policies, as far as the government is concerned, is a very small priority. O on that, uh, ophthalmic priorities are still smaller. But uh, in the last uh, you know, seven decades, India has progressed. Similarly, the policies for uh, ha eye health care have also improved. And in fact, uh, it's not that we have not done uh, something good for country. We have really done a good work in this area and achieve so many things as such. No financial disclosure for this particular talk. Why there's a need of eye health policy, at least from the government uh, point of view, because we know that India has the one of the largest people living with a visual impairment, and that's a very significant number. If you look into the entire world, India would have almost more than 20% population of entire world with a visual impairment. And once we have a visual impairment, uh, friends, it really takes the country towards a poverty. And uh, improving the health uh, of a person depends on the eye health. Because if you see better, you can perform better. You can achieve good quality of education. And if you have education, you can have a better quality of life. You can get to a better, a better areas of your uh, daily functions. And also be a part of uh, national uh, growth in terms of economic growth as such. If you look into a major cause of blindness and visual impairment in our country, we all know cataract is a significant cause. More than 60% people would suffer from a cataract blindness. Corneal blindness has come up in recent years, especially the disorder which affects the cornea, the corneal opacities, and un uncorrected refractive error. In this, I think the major challenge for us for future is going to be a press biopia because we do have a large segment of people suffering from press biopia and they are uncorrected. The word uncorrected is a very important aspect because in periphery, hardly anybody has the correction for press biopia. Glaucoma, diabetic retinopathy, ARMD is uh, going to be there and it's, it's, it's going to be a major challenge for future. So looking at this uh, publication from RP Center, uh, it says that ni almost 93% of people have, you know, opportunity to avoid the blindness. These are avoidable blindness and 97.4% are uh, avoidable visual impairment causes. The major chunk is can be avoided. Therefore, the policy has to be there to implement in such a manner we avoid these blindness to happen. If you look into uh, causes, if you divide treatable causes, we know refractive error, aphakia, cataract, they can all be treated and come back to normal or better than normal sometimes. And major area is a preventable causes. In that, we know that the primary eye care services is a major area which should look into uh, corneal pathologies, trachoma, injuries, infections, and the uh, other surgical areas of glaucoma, cataract, diabetes, retinopathy, and most importantly, look for a prevention of trauma in, in children and adults, especially working group of people also. So it's not that policy which government makes is has to be there. It has to be a government and non-governmental organization to work together to implement these policies to decrease the avoidable or treatable blindness from our country. The current uh, area which government is looking is one is uh, basically a NPCV that is a blindness control program in which uh, various surveys have been done to look into a various causes of blindness in last uh, four or five decades. In that uh, the RAP survey, trachoma control programs, cataract out outreach program, now a school vision screening and eye banking. These are four or five major areas from the government point of view to look into a various surveys to assess the blindness uh, prevalence in our country. Then other area which uh, we are looking for is the building the infrastructure, not only in the tertiary care area, for secondary and primary uh, areas where we need to develop the infrastructure. So once we have the infrastructure, the manpower will come and we can train the manpower of that area, especially the people who are available there, ASHA workers and Aganwadi workers, or we can have teachers also educated to fulfill this area of primary health care in a remote places. Other areas which uh, we are uh, doing is uh, social welfare schemes 
in that uh, uh, Prime Minister's uh, PMJ and Janani Sushu Suraksha Yojana where we treat free of cost the mother and the infant for first one year for any disorder or disease even affecting the eyes also. And then there are various screening programs which are going on basically on the lifestyle change disease like diabetic retinopathy. Glaucoma is one of the area which uh, we are working on and other challenging areas, the school vision areas also. Let me briefly take you to the NPCB uh, program that is initially a National Control of Blindness program, which was initiated in a long time back in 1976. After the initial ICMR survey, which uh, was done between 71 to 73, and uh, at that time, we had trachoma control program attached to a uh, blindness program. We started way back in 1963. And unfortunately, it is not yet a closed chapter for trachoma in our country. It was totally 100% centralized sponsored scheme to begin with. Currently, it is 60-40 for a states and uh, for a state like any and uh, Jammu and Kashmir, it is 90-10. Uh, that is a centrally sp sponsored program. The other important th area of uh, concern is the it has a reach up to 700 districts of India. That means it reaches almost every part of the country and uh, looks into a blindness in these areas. In fact, uh, it is uh, under the non-communicable disease under national health mission, where we are going to look uh, this beyond 2020 to improve the quality of vision in these areas. You all know these were the objectives of uh, national program control of blindness. Basically, major areas to decrease the backlog of blindness. And backlog today is majorly cataract because we consider cataract backlog can be treated and we can actually get the patient back to work with a good vision in these patients. Apart from that, these are various aspects which we are looking for. Most importantly, I would think of enhancing the community awareness in eye care. Because I personally feel unless the education reaches the masses, any scheme is not going to be successful. It is the learning of a people, understanding of people who are actually the consumers, nothing will succeed in those areas also. These are target areas, cataract to diabetic retinopathy, and the goal is to reduce the blindness prevalence 2.03% by 2000, which was subsequently revised to 2020, and uh, under the national health policy to decrease the blindness to 0.25 by 2025. Have we achieved this? So this is the surveys uh, we have done. If you look into ICMR study, the prevalence of 1.38. Now today it, it is 0 0.036. And if you look into the idea was to decrease to 0.3. In 2019, we have achieved 0.36. So if you look into prevalence comparison from 2010 and 2019, there are two studies done by RP Center. At 2020, it was 5.30, now it is 2.55. In terms of uh, no, uh, blindness uh, wise, there's uh, almost 52% reduction as compared to the 2010. And in uh, decreasing the blindness compared to 2010, it is 47% decrease. So this 52 and 47% decrease from 2010 to 2019 is a very significant achievement in our con blindness control program. And uh, in fact, 0.36 is, you know, it, it will come down by 2025 to 0.25. So we are going the right path in, in terms of uh, looking into a blindness control program assess in terms of preventable blindness wise. Cataract is still is the highest because it was 2001, 62%. Instead, it is 66%. The surprising thing is refractive error has you know, decreased from 2001 to hardly any important area because that means our reach for a refractive correction has increased. And the cataract surgical blindness has also decreased. That is a very important point here. It has come to 7.2%, which was earlier around 19 to 20%. So that is a significant change which has happened because sometimes we do large number of cataract surgery and we still produce blindness because of cataract surgery. The next important thing which has come out is a corneal related blindness, especially corneal opacities and other disorders, which is a significant number. And if you look into less than 50 years of age group, their corneal blindness is number one. So people have to work on a corneal area also to lo look into these aspects. If you look to diabetic retinopathy and glaucoma, the percentage is less. But if you look into people suffering from diabetes and glaucoma, it would be higher than a cataract patient in, in long run. So these are areas we have to look for these cases. 
these are key uh, activities from government uh, supporting cataract surgeries, supporting uh, school health screening, especially uh, giving uh, free spectacles to uh, school children. Unfortunately, uh, the number required is a uh, huge, but the providing uh, spectacles from government sector is very, very less. I'll come to that point also. Then uh, donor corneas collection, diagnosis, treatment, diaphragm, retinopathy, Government is going to support all these programs. And uh, as I said in the beginning, infrastructure development is another important area which you look for. And uh, education monitoring is a very uh, important area also. This you all know how much is the financial help uh, given by the government to various uh, surgeries. And uh, more importantly, cornea collection is supported by government. And that is a very important area. In fact, iBanking organization established iBank government supports on government, government set up by rupees 20 lakhs to begin with. So making India cataract free is very important aspect, especially COVID, the new program is going to come where we have to do more than 2.5 crore surgeries in uh, these two years. And uh, we do around 40 or 50 to 60 lakh surgeries. And that has to be doubled every year. I, I'm not sure how we are going to do with the same infrastructure and same manpower. Ashman Bharat is a very successful program being organized uh, by the government since 2017. And this has uh, basically two health and uh, wellness uh, centers been established. And this uh, PMJ program looks into various uh, areas of concern in uh, all uh, medical health required. In terms of ophthalmology, there are at least 42 uh, procedures been uh, categorizing this and cataract is one of the largest segment in this group of cases. The other uh, important area was for us is, you know, uh, these are uh, which we do, Janani Sushu Suraksha uh, Karikaram and Rastri Bal Suraksha Karikaram. These are things which we cover all people under this. Then employment schemes, schemes, uh, it may be EHS, CGHS and CHS, a lot of other things are there which uh, government controls. Uh, this is RP Center's involvement where we do a lot of free work for these patients. School uh, screening program is a major uh, aspect for our government now. We are looking to cover almost every school, if possible, in the country. Train the teachers to assess the you know, uh, vision in these patients. If any poor vision is uh, seen, then optometrist is uh, concerned. Optometrist it does the refraction. If there's any disease process, then ophthalmology is taken uh, into uh, account and subsequent treatment is done. This is a chart which is placed in every school where it is uh, corresponding to six by nine and teachers are supposed to do this. Uh, do these. Eye banking, you all know, 1945, the first eye bank established in the RIO Chennai. Since then, we have a significant number, around 72 uh, eye banks are listed. Only 149 are active and uh, less than 10 eye banks are there where they do more than 1,000 transplants. So this has to increase, increase significantly. In recent time, SCRP has taken over in terms of collection. More than 50% or 60% eyes are collected through SCRP program. Trachoma, to, uh, as I said, started in 1963. In 2017, we could declare active trachoma free from the country. Now we are doing a survey in 200 districts of country in the endemic uh, zones, uh, which were declared in 1963 by WHO. Uh, this year we complete the entire survey and uh, uh, this uh, will be declared, the country will be declared trachoma free uh, ultimately in 2023 after almost you know, 70 years. These are new areas we're looking for, uh, corner opacity areas, doing a new survey across the entire country to look into uh, important aspects of a corner blindness and uh, subsequently uh, improving the uh, you know, uh, eye banking, transplants, education, teaching in these areas also. These are, uh, uh, this was a belt where we had an endemic uh, uh, cornea, uh, uh, trachoma related problems. Now we are doing the other uh, surveys to look into trichiasis and corneal opacity. We did, uh, I'm going to summarize this. Uh, these are other programs which do, Orbis is another area. Just to highlight here, what is the discrepancy we have? This should have been the actual pyramid in a government setup. But you can see this is the little offset pyramid which is there where we require you know, more vision centers which are supposed to be 20,000, we have only 4,000. So we need to increase this area also and have the you know, uh, ophthalmic assistance serving these areas also. These are primary care area which we annually do it. Large number of cases are done through this and these are service provided in you know, these vision centers. These are basically primary healthcare areas 
and we have really achieved a significant decrease in the blindness from 1.34 to 0.36 uh, prevalence, which will come down to 0.25 subsequently. These are various challenges uh, for our, removing the preventable blindness from our country. Major load is cataract and future is diabetes, retinopathy, glaucoma, and ARMD going to be there. I, I think uh, universal eye health can be achieved in the country with the support of government uh, and the NGOs which are going to come. These are future roadmaps which I see that this has to be taken care of. Myopia, breast myopia, diabetic and the macular degeneration are going to be a major challenge for future for all of us, especially breast myopia, where uh, we have uh, various organizations working on giving free spectacles to children and breast myopia people. people. Uh, last year, we I think we could give around uh, nine lakh uh, spectacles in this area. The uh, requirement is almost two crores. So this is a difficult uh, time where government has to upgrade uh, their policies and take all the NGOs and private sector with them to achieve these uh, difficult tasks for future. Thank you for your kind listening. Okay. Thank you so much, Professor Ritel, for exhaustive uh, review of the efforts done by the government to reduce the blindness. We now move on to the next talk, Self-Sustaining Community Eye Hospital by Dr. R.D. Ravindra. Yeah. Dr. So, so good morning. I mean, uh, thanks for the opportunity to Dr. Partha and others, the AUI's scientific committee, to present this. I mean, we just heard from uh, Dr. Tetyal the, the prevalence of blindness in India. So, but if you know, if you, if you see this as numbers, not as percentage, we have close to about 47 lakh people who are blind, who are vision less than. The presenting visual acuity is less than 3 by 60. Those who have severe visual impairment, that is between 3 by 60 to less than 6 by 60 is about another 46 lakhs. Those who have moderate visual impairment is like 2.45 crores. And now the WHO has redefined the threshold for intervention, which is early visual impairment. So anybody less than the vision of less than 6 by 12, I think whether it's a cataract or not, refractive error, it is mandatory to correct them. So all this adds up to about close to 7.3 crore people who need the uh, some kind of intervention. This is you know beyond even routine screening of glaucoma, diabetic retinopathy, managing all of that. So who may not come under this category? So the, the problem is huge. So as he mentioned, the government alone won't be able to take care of all these patients. We also need the patients who have to be cared by other non-governmental organizations. The one thing is only 40% of this population can afford to pay for the care. The, of the 7.3 crore patients, only 40% can pay for it. Nearly 60% won't be able to pay for it. And not only that, among this 50% of 60%, nearly about 50% or 30% of the population cannot even reach a facility. Who We have to reach them either have through a primary vision care centers or through a community outreach camps becomes very, very important. So this is where the role of community eye hospitals is really needed, who can create the awareness, create the access, and also make it affordable for the population. And again, why this, uh, these organizations have to be self-sustaining? Because the cost of the equipment and other resources, there are also pressures on accreditation. And there is also a reducing support for you know, recurring expenses from the international NGOs. And any hospital requires a profit or a surplus if they really have to upgrade themselves or remain sustainable in the long term. So when you talk about self-sustaining, it is both you know, financial sustainability or the viability and also ensuring the availability of the human resources. Both are equally important. I'll touch upon both. When you look at the financial viability, it is about you know, how do we meet the expected financial needs from the sources on which we have full control. We may be getting maybe you know, some kind of philanthropic support from outside or, or from the government as a grant in aid. But you know, we need to have get revenue which will be more than the cost of the eye care services we deliver in the organization. So here, both you know, maximizing the revenue becomes important and minimizing the cost becomes important. When you're maximizing the revenue, it's also, at the same time, we also need to take care of social obligations and you know, take care of the market dynamics. And we need to minimize the cost 
at the same time not compromising on the patient satisfaction or the quality both are equally important just looking at you know these maximizing revenue and the minimizing cost actually go together they are cannot be seen separately but now there are three distinct things which really impact the revenue one is the volume other one is the service mix and the third part is the how do you close the loop the the volume is really important for a community hospital so one you know we need to make sure that we are accessible to all the sections of the community so any community hospital should have a, a free and a, a paying section should have services available from morning to evening and ensuring surgery for the patients on the same day you know because if you are going to ask the patient to come back again we are going to make the access difficult and we're going to increase the cost for the patient and you know all these are important to lower the threshold and again having the primary eye care centers dr titial showed that government is looking at 40000 plus centers where they have about 4 or 5000 centers these vision centers really create you know better access for the patient and also make it affordable because only 10% of the patients who are seen in this rural vision centers have to come to the hospital so that much you know the cost is lowered and just sharing this data from the vatani hospitals where we have about eight vision centers where in each the year we see little over 100000 patients and about 3000 patients are for surgery and again you know those who cannot be reached either through the hospital or the vision center you need this the eye cams and the dr titial also talked about the various forms in which we need to the cams we need to conduct and this is an interesting slide now this is i'm just showing the 100% of the patients and their breakup you know the what what you see on the top all yellow is all the free patients and the bottom which is the blue is all the our paying patients so in the year sometime in the 1990 as we introduced intraocular lenses only for the paying patients so then you know the, the slowly the number of the percentage of the paying patients went up to even 35 to 40% but the minute the government started subsidizing the services in the camp they said no they'll even pay for the iol surgery then you know it completely dropped even went below 20% at some point of time but as the economy became better the quality of life became better in the country slowly the the paying volume also increased today we have about about 40% of the patients this also reflects in a way the economy of the of the people so here you see this is a in 1985 nearly 90% of the patient their annual income was less than a lakh but today that number has come down to about that percentage has come down to about 22% as a result we have lot more patients who can pay for the services and you know so there is a, a group you know which can pay above cost but the large population can only pay for the yeah, subsidized things and again when we looked at you know what the community can pay which hospital we looked at what is the average revenue per surgery one of our hospital in theni the average surgery was about less than about around 5000 rupees compared to the other hospitals when we looked at it we found that our hospital at theni being a rural hospital was not advising fake emulsification surgery for this patient patients so when we changed that the uptake of the surgery you know from the of fake surgeries went from you no know, for 40% to 59% of the total cataracts operated interestingly with the total volume also increased over a period of time yeah so and again the this is a, this is one other uh, instance where a hospital where the number of patients uh, were you no know, they were seeing close to about 4000 plus patients only 1000 were getting operated 3000 were not getting operated the second year similar they have advised a surgery for 3000 patients but they are operating only 1000 so as a result the both years together they have not operated on 5000 patients so if you put that average of 10000 per surgery you know there is a lost opportunity here so how do you closing the loop through counseling and other mechanism becomes very very important and again the service mix you know if you see this is an example where the outpatient number went by 3% but the cataract surgery volume went up by 13% these total surgeries went up by 15% but the income went by 30% the reason one the number of cataract surgeries went up higher maybe because of a better counseling and there is also a patients moving towards you know taking premium lenses and higher high priced packages all of that that service also mix also can impact on the the revenue 
So I'll just skip. There are two things you know, which will drive the cost. One is your efficiency and the scale. We are talking about your fixed cost and the uh, variable cost. I'll just skip, skip these things. I'll go to the... And again, you know, paying attention to quality becomes very important. The good quality will reduce the cost. A good communication willing uh, also enhances the willingness to pay. And again, when you do uh, like a community work, local community takes care of certain amount of the expenses. The hospital takes certain amount of the expenses. And the government, through the grant in aid, we are also able to cover. And then the overall, this again makes the whole approach, the community oriented approach also makes it easier. I'll just go to the one last slide, which is on the marginal cost. And I've taken the example of one of our hospitals in the in uh, Thaini, where we close, do close to about 10,000 surgeries. So here, look at it. This is a, like a old data. The year 2008, they uh, did about, uh, in the, not 2000, there's 2008 uh, surgeries. There's a fixed cost is about 94 lakhs and the variable cost is about 25 lakhs. Overall cost is about 1.19 crores. The unit cost per surgery is about 5,938. And you know, the Whereas the fee which we charge, you know, average was about 7,000 plus rupees. As a result, we were able to create a surplus of about 33 lakhs from this patient. So these paying patients were able to take care of all the fixed cost also. And, and you know, when, when you are able to cover all the fixed costs through your paying patients, the rest of the patients who are subsidized or com come from the camp, so whatever cost they are paying or whatever cost you get as reimbursement from the grant in aid, you are able to generate a, a marginal surplus. We have done about close to about uh, 5,000, you can say about 5,500 surgeries. We were able to even there earn about 15 lakh rupees from that. So you were, because all your fixed cost is taken care by the paying patients, so you are able to still generate a, a revenue. It's also, it's all again, you know, coming back to the volume and the scale, which is important for a community-based hospital. Again, ensuring human resources, training, all of that is important. And also monitoring information system is really equally important to ensure that you, know, you build it. And again, it ultimately, it's all about a purpose-driven leadership, the building the organization DNA Can you wrap is up, very please? important. Yeah, is the last slide. And having an inclusive design, a culture of cost consciousness, and evidence-driven organization is all that important. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Abhindran. We move on to the next talk, Looking Beyond Affordable Eye Care Delivery by Dr. Devashish. May I request Dr. Shetty to please set up your slides? Good morning, everybody. Uh, uh, we are always uh, now hearing that it's India's decade, if not India's century. And uh, by 27, we're going to be a $5 trillion economy. The demographic dividends are uh, uniquely placed in our favor. Of course, we have the challenges of the diversity and the inequity of our country. But uh, strategically, India is becoming geopolitically very important. And uh, if you see that the, the, they're not going to be only USA as a power block, uh, they're going to be multiple power blocks, and India is going to be another powerhouse. And uh, so this is a big opportunity. And uh, we really need to take up this opportunity because all these years, we felt we could do more. But the only thing is I, the people could not afford. And so we were find, finding all means of compassionate capitalism uh, and doing so many other things uh, to try and balance out things and get to everybody to uh, provide comprehensive eye care. But here's the opportunity. And uh, if you say affordability, over our, uh, uh, Dr. RDR was also telling us uh, 
we see that the affordability is uh, uh, one month per capita income is uh, probably the cost which is comfortable for uh, cataract surgery and a one day per capita for OPD expenses of the particular place. And this, if it goes up, the, the, our opportunities go up. And uh, if you uh, follow the uh, uh, anti vegf story also, you will find that again, this becomes the biggest uh, segment, almost 50%. Uh, these are old statistics, but uh, even now, the uh, whole things have, haven't quite changed. So um, again, if we say the diversity, I mean, West Bengal's GDP is half of Maharashtra's and one fourth of Delhi's. So, you know, the affordabilities uh, uh, differ. Uh, Disha has to be an affordable and a low cost uh, hospital because we are located in West Bengal. So uh, uh, this is a map of uh, the, uh, uh, to show very uh, interestingly how the uh, co per ticket cost of cataract surgery in Disha has changed over the GDP or the per capita in West Bengal. Now it is 20,000 in the year 2022, last year. So uh, this is how uh, we can actually uh, have more people to afford quality eye care. But definitely it has to be equitable and be inclusive. And uh, uh, obviously, uh, trying uh, cost containment is a major strategy in this direction. Uh, I mean, some can afford to be costly and uh, be elusive and exclusive. But uh, this is, uh, you know, technology is the biggest enabler, systems, delegations, processes, and, uh, you know, the ability to scale up and uh, propagate and uh, also, you know, using economies of scale are uh, the things which we can uh, imbibe in uh, uh, more efficiently as uh, the economy improves. Often there is this connotation that low cost is probably low quality, but uh, perhaps, you know, uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, definitely quality is not uh, is non-negotiable. Non but uh, if you remember that uh, simply flying days, and uh, if you say, think of the most popular airline today, uh, there is a very strat uh, strategic difference. They were fairly priced. They did not com uh, compromise on operational efficiency, their aircrafts. I mean, they just said that what does the flyer want? A flyer wants to fly from one destination to the other without huss and fuss. So let us give them that and on time. So uh, 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 simple strategic things and they bought 100 aircrafts when the Indian skies didn't have 100 aircrafts. Today they have a fleet of almost 300 aircrafts and uh, uh, occupy more than 50% of the aviation market. So again, you know, when we talk about patient experience, now it's about giving experiences to the patient rather than care uh, or uh, treatment. Uh, so the question, uh, first question that comes to our mind is what can the patient, what does the patient want? Well, frankly, uh, I would say that it's not a very good question to ask because they want everything. They want the best time, the best consultant, uh, the most suitable place, the best equipments and everything. But uh, uh, a better question probably would be what is the patient willing to pay for? Because in a growing economy, these are the orders which we have to pass through. So if we ask this question and we get a proper answer, we are addressing the community needs in a more uh, uh, logical sense. And then carry this affordability to aspirations. Yes, obviously at some point, eye care and health care has to get aspirational. So cost is the first step in 
towards quality. And uh, unless it is uh, not affordable, it doesn't exist. But if we focus on quality, definitely the cost will improve because one of the biggest aspects of quality is that in, it definitely improves cost. And simplification is uh, ultimate uh, sophistication. And, uh, you know, you, we have to have very transparent and <coughs> records every transaction, go brick by brick so that, you know, we don't have sleeping costs. Infrastructures can be on rent equipment, on higher purchases. Sleeping costs could be brought down. Appointments could make systems more efficient. Multitasking of staff, doctors on incentives, uh, rather than a uh, stocked up salary and everybody in the organization to try justify their remuneration when you focus on cost and cost efficiencies and the organization is patient centric and it is always uh, tries to be on the patient side and uh, justifying the cost of services that you may choose this lens why are you paying so much more so like kind of thing and we even use optos as an indirect ophthalmoscopy and because we find the retina surgeon probably thinks he doesn't want to bend his back so much, rather is more interested in lasers or surgery. So it works and uh, we recover the costs. So having said that, we also use lambda flow theatres for everything because it is the environment which creates the discipline of the theatre. and. Uh, uh, I'll skip these slides. I think Partho asked another basic question why he put this uh, beyond affordable eye care. So one is eye care. So he probably asked Disha what is the next thing. We are actually di diversifying into uh, multi-speciality care. So we have uh, taken up a three acre uh, plot and the construction is on. Uh, hopefully by September next year, we will be having a 5 lakh square feet, 600 bedded hospital. And uh, the reason is because we had surplus. Uh, and uh, so what to do with it when we asked our staff, I asked our doctors, and more importantly, our patients, they said, okay, I mean, you give us good eye care. Well, what happens to my knee? What happens to my uh, husband's kidney problem? And uh, why don't you do something around that? And uh, so we have uh, our old doctor friends who can actually uh, uh, help us out on this uh, uh, multi-speciality um, uh, enterprise. And uh, eye care is more competitive. And uh, I think a lot needs to be done in the general space. Branding is automatic. We are a pan Bengal brand. So, and our own 18 hospitals can act as satellite centers. So, beyond affordable eye care, I think that's our next step. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Debeshish. Uh, it was great comparing the increase in the volume of surgery with the increase in the per capita income. And uh, uh, thank you so much for sharing your thought processes on how to build up the practices. Now we move on to the next very important component for all of us that is looking after our health and we have Dr. Narain to, to talk on leaders stay healthy. But the you know, concept what uh, Dr. Ravindran talked about, Dr. Ravindran, uh, R.D. Ravindran? The concept you uh, talked about, you know, you have a paying patient and non-paying patients. And the surplus of paying patient money is used for a non-paying patient to, you know, increase the, you know, uh, people who have actual suffering. So ultimately, the amount of backlog we have, we have to, you know, put some money into that so that we can, you know, enhance our surgical rate. And what you talked about, I think there is a justification where government has to look into increasing the, you know, reimbursement money also. So that we fulfill the all the you know consumables used in that particular surgery apart from the IOM. I think they all these you know data will help us for the government. Uh, we can justify the cost as to go up. You know, 
टुडे विद नो दिस प्राइम मिनिस्टर प्रोग्राम वी आर पेइंग 7500 रुपीस फॉर वन कैथलिक सर्जरी व्हिच मे नॉट बी सफिशिएंट टू सस्टेन द यू नो फॉर लॉन्ग टर्म एंड लार्ज नंबर ऑफ सर्जरी आल्सो सो देयर इज आई थिंक वी नीड टू वर्क ऑन दैट एरिया आल्सो मैं आई गिव अ ब्रीफ कमेंट ऑन दैट नो आई मीन या या नो वन इज नो द वेरिएबल कॉस्ट द वेरिएबल कॉस्ट इन कैटरैक्ट सर्जरी इज not much what really drives the cost is the the fixed cost so the fixed cost of people who have volume they are able to address it but if you don't have volume then you know then it's a, it's a problem so today what the government gives probably will cover the the variable cost but there also has to be some allocation for the fixed cost then more people will also take it and the government should actually uh, try out uh, and find out their <coughs> own cost what is the cost of a cataract surgery in rp center or maybe in a district hospital i mean uh, before they impose it on private uh, sector or the uh, 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 yeah, yeah, uh, the problem in government the costing is they only look at the variable cost they don't look at the fixed cost. cost yeah they don't look at the fixed cost that's where the whole problem so I, i think i think it'll be a good idea to provide centers which have the fixed cost in it and then other doctors can come and you know operate there and you know that that way nobody will mind doing more surgeries also but the other thing which is very uh, which is very important to discuss is that uh, if you notice recently in rajasthan the government tried to bring in a legislation providing emergency free healthcare which led to a lot of strikes and demands so the question is why in ophthalmology always there's an insistence on free cataract surgery and we show all these tables of free cataract surgery because when you go to do an eye cap you ask the patient for cataract surgery is willing free but if you ask them that when somebody had an appendicitis in the family they went to a hospital and paid for it so the question is that if they can pay for an appendicitis they can pay for a delivery now dr jebachish is considering into multi speciality why shouldn't there be some fixed cost for a cataract surgery i'm sure even the poorest of poor can pay 500 rupees or 1000 rupees for a cataract surgery by calling it free actually we debase the meaning also and we prevent the private practitioners from entering the community of ophthalmology field This is something we need looking into. Actually, sir, we are talking of this NPCP and all these programs, but the reality on the ground it is very different. Basically, government provides only two thousand rupees to the in the camps to the NGOs, and even then, that also due to this bureaucracy and all that, the the payments are not made for six months, eight months. They, I mean, at the lower level, they just. <laughs> Uh, stop the bills and all that. The, the ground reality is quite different. We are we are doing camps. We know it. The payments are not done for even six months, eight months, and that too they will cut down. They will make it from two thousand to seven hundred, five hundred. This is the actual real situation. This you should raise the things at the high level. This at least the new uh, backlog uh, thing which uh, government is trying to get rid of at uh, almost two point five crore cataract uh, backlog. in that uh, the payment uh, will be done in a in a very appropriate manner there's a special fund for that and things will improve there right yeah uh, thank you sir actually uh, i'm sorry for the small confusion dr pratha had uh, told me to talk on on different topic uh, my father was supposed to talk about uh, you know uh, reversing diseases and uh, food so uh, uh on this onset i'd like to thank uh, ars for giving me this opportunity uh so today's question is how do i start my private practice or generally how do i start my practice see now the path to becoming a doctor is pretty simple and clear everyone goes through it and you can reach uh and once you've reached the 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 phase where you become a doctor suddenly the question crops up what do i do next and there are a series of questions which come to our head so always remember where you start is not as important as where you finish So all of us start at different starting points, right? Some of us start in a in a place where you are one of the first doctors in your family and friends, and uh, you have very little money in your pocket. The other scenario where you can start is uh, where you are again one of the first doctors in your family and friends, but you have enough uh, uh, or a lot of money in your pocket. And the next scenario is you already have a nice, good uh, established.
give you suggestions on where to start your practice, how to uh, build your practice, and also uh, put you across certain contacts with the company so that you get good deals when you're planning to acquire these machines. Now, when you're going for the uh, machines for your private practice, initially it's good to go on a rental basis so that uh, it's very light and or you can also go for a refurbished uh, machine initially. And as you move forward and you can afford a good new one, then you can go ahead with that. The next thing is uh, refractive uh, practice. You can start from the very beginning itself. You, you don't need to do any investment. Uh, with the fake IOLs, you can start, if you have a cataract setup, then automatically you can start your refractive uh, setup also. So that what happens from then itself, you're building up your refractive, uh, you know, a patient, a group of patients who keep coming to you uh, so that when, when you do uh, buy your lasers, then it becomes easy for the transition. So it's not the salary that makes you rich, it's the spending habit that actually makes you rich. Please remember this. <laughs> so the next uh, starting point is what if you're in a scenario where you have uh, adequate or enough money in your pocket, but you are one of the first one in your family and friends. So in this scenario, when you're starting your private practice, uh, go all out, make sure you build a good big hospital uh, comprehensive, make sure you have all specialties, uh, have the best machines and try to minimize referrals. Do not refer patients. Uh, uh, try to uh, somehow slowly you know, uh, get the, uh, you know, skilled doctors to handle uh, all kind of scenarios. So it's very, very important. And when you de decide the location, you always do a mar market survey and then uh, decide where you want to place your hospital. Um, always assess your local competitors and uh, see their, what is their plus points, what their minus points. And, uh, and uh, other thing is also the price, what everyone is, uh, uh, you know, uh, look at Look, look around and see what everyone is pricing for different procedures, uh, consultation fees. So initially, when you do launch your hospital or start your private practice, you can maybe as a promotion, you can really do a very competitive price initially so that there's more footfall and then slowly you can uh, change accordingly. The next thing is always, always, uh, you know, have a good relationship uh, with the multi-speciality uh, hospitals or physicians who, uh, you know, refer. If at all do they do refer, always write back to them and also inform them what's happening to the patient. This is a very, very, very important step. Now, what if you're in a scenario where, okay, you already have a good hospital with you, you just have to go in and uh, it, it, the, the process seems easy. No, actually, it's not. <laughs> this also is very difficult. And always do not be afraid to give up the good to go for the great. So this is a very uh, more of a fine tuning process. You have to really micromanage. So these are the few steps that you need to look at. Uh, you have to uh, come out of the system and look from outside how, how the hospital is doing first. You need to really assess how you know, the, already the, the system is working. Look into the get into the patient's shoes. See uh, uh, what the patient likes about your hospital, what the patient does not like about your hospital. And also uh, you need to make... Uh, uh, make the hospital more efficient. Look at the system and how the flow goes. You have to improve it by, you know, you have to, by one, one of the ways is to reduce the, I mean, uh, reduce the lower margin. You need to be very cost effective. You, you have to monitor the needless spending or expenditure. The small things make a big difference, you know, uh, like be it a tissue box, you know, sometimes excessively uh, tissue is being used uh, left, right and center or hand sanitizers, you know, you would start from the small and then you go up from IOLs, viscoelastics, everything should be monitored and see how you can do it. And also look for if, you know, somebody is trying to uh, fool you or cheat the system and uh, try to, uh, you know, uh, close these loopholes is very, very important. Now, try to assess the individual performance of uh, all the different doctors and the staff and try to see how you can improve their skills. See, we keep uh, train as a training institute, we keep training our fellows and uh, students. Then suddenly we're like, actually, we just realized we are not trained. Our uh, consultants, they only don't know these techniques. The uh, fellows and uh, students are uh, going, knowing this technique and going out. So please do not forget your own uh, uh, stuff. And then uh, create certain standards and uh, parameters so that the outcome of the, uh, the treatment and the outcome of the patients is the same throughout the hospital. The next thing is training the paramedical staff is very, very crucial. Educating the counselors is so important. They should really know what procedure, what is done in the procedure, what uh, what each IOL does, how is it different from each other. See, it's very important. Simply, uh, you know, uh, okay, just counsel the patient, convince them for a package. It shouldn't be like that. They have to really know why is it more better, they, why the higher package is more better. So it's very important this. And also write uh, some kind of a script so that it's the same lines that they keep talking to the patient. Uh, so that the standard is maintained throughout the counseling. 
Can you wrap up, please? Yes, sir. The next thing is strategizing is very important. Uh, when uh, See, now once you have optimized your own system, then what you can think, think about is expanding. So uh, when you're trying to uh, expand, again, you have to do a market survey, uh, look for places uh, where it would uh, strategically work really well. And also, if you're planning to uh, buy a land and then build a, uh, one more branch, you think about whether it's better to buy it outright or is it better to uh, take it on a lease and pay rent? Because you need to do a simple calculation. Let's say if the uh, land cost is about three crores, is it uh, is it good or uh, uh, it, it good to buy it out? Or let's say if I put this same money in a bank with the eight percent interest, will, does it work out? So you have to do this calculation and see whether the leasing is better or not. The Can next thing is, up? Can you sum it up, please? Uh, yeah, this is my last slide, sir. So the next thing is just to have an edge over uh, the different other hospitals. Uh, you can uh, please get into uh, research. Uh, th that way, uh, all the staff is already, uh, you know, they keep updating themselves in terms of knowledge and skills and uh, try to uh, incorporate uh, research which you translate to your clinics too so that you give back to the society in terms of better techniques, better surgery and be better machines. What is common in all categories or all of us should do is uh, we need to be humble. We need to really connect with the people. Make sure that you genuinely care care for your patients because patients know what you genuinely uh, are feeling inside. Uh, always encourage the patients to give their feedback. Uh, have a healthy relationship uh, with your uh, competitors. Please do not bring any doctor down. Not just any doctor, any person down in your life. Always uh, encourage everyone. Be positive because at the end of the day, we have to remind ourselves why are we here. We are here to help our patients and bring a smile on them. Thank you. Thank you. We move on to the next talk, pyramidal model of eye care delivery. Good morning, everyone. So I've been discussing about uh, different ways of treating our patients and preventing the blindness. That's what we have been discussing and how to run this more efficiently and get this done. So we briefly touched about the pyramidal model of healthcare uh, that uh, Professor Tithyal has talked about. So it's basically about health for all and we have lots of need. What are the problems, the challenges which we face? The challenges are there is insufficient workforce, less infrastructure, and the more people who are not all at one place, they are distributed all throughout the country. So how are we going to deal with it? So not many people, if you look at any of the ophthalmologists or an optometrist which we have trained, how many of them are ready to go to a village and work? So it's going to be a difficult task to get them to go and do it there. And other thing which we realized, how many of our patients are ready to come to a city or a major town to get their health checkup done? For that matter, how many of us are ready to go to a doctor when, we, when you don't have much problem? A regular primary health care is going to suffer. We are not bothered about our health. The same thing happens with our patients. And they don't want to leave their work and can spend one, two days to go to a, so a nearest town and get their checkups done. That's not happening. So we need to do something for it. That's where the pyramidal model comes in. Like what Dr. Tithyal was talking about, the majority of these, as uh, Professor Raimdran was talking about, can be tackled, 90% of them, at their own place where they are in. That's where the pyramidal model comes into picture. So 
the importance of the pyramidal model again the base of the pyramid has to be broad if not the pyramid is not going to be stable so you need to make sure that the pyramidal base is large so the pyramidal model which we developed is uh, consists of the people from the community where we take them and train them a little and give them technology and techniques for them to identify minimum basic problems so we have a uh, vision guardians who are usually there for 5000 people they take care of 5000 population so they go there they are in the village they are in the same village they just go there do this minimum screening if they need anything they raise an alarm okay fine you need to go to the next level so the next level usually is a vision center vision center is nothing but a smaller setup where you have one exam room what you have in your clinic so you have a minimum basic equipment maybe along with that you add a little more of uh, technology like a few cameras for you to do a teleconsult from there so that you, they don't need to come to get an opinion from a doctor to a city so the technician who's there just got trained for two years they are not an optometrist you pick up from them the community train them and put them back there they're going to be there they're going to you're going to create a uh, job for them at the same time you are creating a resource which is going to be there with their community forever it's not that when i have time i come to you no we are there every time when i the patient has time they can come and get your things done that's the difference so that's the vision center which we do so this model you goes to the next level where we have people when you identify the 10 percent which we are talking about when you have 10 percent problems which cannot be tackled using a teleconsult or a refractive error which you have dealt there at that time you go to the next level that's called a service center or a secondary center which we talk about this is usually for a five lakh population so when these centers are used with an ophthalmologist there in that place these are in the smaller towns or a centers which are i would say second type towns so where you have a setup you can do a surgeries you can do most of the cataract surgeries there uncomplicated and most of the minimal procedures like even the glaucoma like we were talking about glaucoma is a major problem so most of the glaucoma can be tackled in these centers they don't need to come to a tertiary center in the cities so, so that's what happens at the secondary center or service center things which cannot be handled in this place are the ones which needs to go to the tertiary center where you have a major uh, specialist sitting there or a high-end techniques and technology which is sitting there which is not required in those centers so we call this as a group of uh, vision guardians vision center uh, secondary centers as a village vision complex the whole thing is a complex when all this work together only then this will work again it's not it's not enough for us to have each level and not working together so the thing which we have in these centers is if once a patient is into the system his record can be accessed from vision center to the tertiary center whatever wherever there and then we can go back to the vision center there still the record is maintained and you can actually see monitor the patient right from all throughout the network that's what makes it unique so that you know patient does not need to worry about i have to carry too many things i go to a different center i don't know what's happening so that's the village vision complex to integrate so this is the thing which happens so this patient and the vision center in the remote rural village was picked up by a vision technician to have a retinoblastoma when they were screening it in the vision center sent back to the secondary center realize that this needs to be done to the tertiary center so instead of going there with the teleconsult we send the patient directly to the tertiary center get the treatment done and then go back to the vision center and whenever it's required he'll come back so that the patient need not travel too much and if any time we go to a different town you need to stay there we are only talking about our cost we are not talking about what the patient it cost to. we might do surgery free but the patient also spending other than that so that's something you need to be cognizant of that fact so that's where the pyramidal model comes in and the tertiary centers which will take care of any of the complex issues so this is our network if you look at the 
base. So all those green dots are all the vision centers. So each secondary center has a 10 vision centers around it. And each tertiary center is again connected. So the lines which are there, they're all connected to the next level. So that's the distribution. We still see this lots of gaps around. We still need to work on it. And that's not going to happen only with us. We all together, we can work together to make it possible. So it's not that one person can do this or one organization can do this. Like government, is, it's not enough for only government to work on it. We all should be able to do this. Only then we'll be able to do it, all this possible. So that's in short about pyramidal model. And uh, we all can work together. Thank you, Rajiv, uh, for your presentation. I think we know that you know, LB Prasad has been uh, successful in uh, implementing this pyramidal uh, entire, you know, uh, the entire coastal area of uh, you know, Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, and other areas also up to Odisha. And uh, that showcases the how effectively it can be used. We understand. In the meantime, we'll invite Dr. Garewal to put up his presentation. And it is the need of our, we have to go to the grassroots level where he talked about uh, the actual community has to be trained into uh, identifying the disorder, disease, and the local people, either the, you know, the panchayat, sarpanch, or teacher at the school, or the, you know, asha worker, aganwadi workers, they have to be trained into picking up these disorders for which uh, we are working on uh, how to uh, build these people to detect eye disorders. We are working on a cataract uh, platform where each ASHA worker will be, you know, paid 500 rupees for getting a cataract patient identified and bringing them to the center where surgery can be done. After the surgery, they will be paid 500 rupees. So this is how we are going to train these people and maybe like we can uh, have a successful program for other things also. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Rajiv. That's what for what do with Vision Guardians. Yeah. Thank you, Rajiv. Now we have Dr. Garewal. Uh, uh, he's going to talk about building blocks of an... Uh, enduring uh, practice. Thank you, Tujal, sir. Uh, my talk will be <clears throat> my journal uh, impressions about how you try to sustain your practice. So, so three phases of practice, starting, building, and sustaining. And each phase has a different approach. And I'll be mainly talking about how to sustain it. And this is an albatross, and it when we went to Antarctica, this started following the ship from Ushuaia, and for 600 kilometers, the, the bird was flying along with the ship. So that is what the sustainability, and that is what you should be looking into your practice. Uh, this is the key competency chart, which is displayed everywhere, and we encourage each and every team member and remind them that we are going to build up organization on these key competencies. The decision-making is very important, and that is what you all took a decision to start the practice. And usually it is a single decision in the past that has changed the course of one's life. And maybe one had not realized it at the time of taking a decision. So you need to take a decision. You should have the information, analyze it, and take a decision. When you take a decision, uh, I, I feel taking a decision is number one, decision number one. Number two is a wrong decision. And number three is indecision, which should not be acceptable. And there is nothing like a wrong or right decision when you take the decision. It is only after you have made a decision that you set on a journey to prove to the world that your decision was right. So decision making is more of an art than a science and it should be taken very quickly. And you need commitment. This, this is the commitment you see from the mother to the kid. That is the kind of the commitment you need to have with your organization. And unless the commitment is made, uh, uh, then the things are quite unclear and commitment should be there right for your patients, your people and your team. It's also important to start to differentiate between initiative and initiative. Initiative is everyone. There is no human being which doesn't have initiative. But what differentiates you from other or what differentiates the practice is taking it to its logical conclusion or finish, initiative. I wish the word initiative comes into the dictionary because that is what I find many times lacking in the team members that they'll start something but will not take it to its logical conclusion. And for sustaining, you have to dream. We saw the dream of Dr. Devashish. Now that is what is important. You dream great dreams, think great thoughts, 
and only the great actions will follow. And be a dreamer, but don't forget about the incremental innovation, which was already touched, that even if there is a small improvement that you can make in your organization, please do it. Don't think that I'll, I'll bring a change only once I have a, a bigger or a great I bigger idea with me. Uh, planning is important, but uh, don't translate the word planning into the time wasted between the first thought to do something and actually doing it. So you, 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 whatever you want, you, you execute it. Otherwise, there will be distractions coming on the way. Uh, these distractions you are important to identify. Uh, they don't come with a label. You have to find how to control them, how to focus on your tasks. Uh, and, and this is the biggest enemy. The distraction may be to do something what others are doing. Distraction may be someone suggesting you that you move away from your focus. You have made a focus, I want to do this. Some people will, you'll see what others are doing and start following them and then you miss on to the, your target. Don't be worried about the failures, they will be coming, but then the success is always there and you need to learn how to handle your uh, failures and you need persistence, tenacity, stamina, endurance, perseverance, strategy to be there. And failure is a pause, not an end. So when you are, when you are sustaining a practice, now in business there is nothing like a horizontal graph. The businesses move in two directions, either they go up or they go down. So you have to differentiate from others in the, in, in the eyes of the patient with some originality and you have to maintain some edge and by cut, copy, paste, you cannot be a leader. So you have to be innovative and you have to differentiate and in differentiation, surprise is an important component of differentiating yourself, your practice from others. Uh, opportunities do come. Uh, they may come in the form of a good staff. They may come in the form of new equipment available. Uh, they are never lost. If you don't avail the opportunity, someone else will await. Do not wait for the opportunities, create them. Now one, two, these now are very important building blocks for maintaining practice. One is the space, that is your physical uh, property or physical component, and second is the manpower. And you have to focus on these two things. Uh, these days, important components are the EMR, the, your hospital management system, and communication. These three are going to, to determine how efficient, how lean, and how, how progressive your business is going to be. And they are very, very important components. Now, culture is one of the biggest influences on the team performance. It's a glue that binds the team. And the glue or culture starts with the underlying values, missions, and purpose. That is how the key competency was shown that build connections and commitments. Strive to build an honest, transparent, low ego culture. And culture, like the way we understand culture, the culture here for the organization is also a living thing and it's ever evolving matrix of organization, ready to fill the spaces on the, as the organization grows. Be open. One of the things you should do is listen closely to your team. So you need both culture and you need both people to lead to the growth. And same is with the system. Now, you have people, but that you need system. And any organization, depending heavily on the people, is always at a great risk. Too much of knowledge, skill concentrated in few team members is a potential threat. A robust system takes charge and provides scaffolding to team members to work upon, and the system is able to assimilate a new team member to perfection in a very, very short time. And so, so what is system? What do we mean by system? I like to define it that take homo sapiens out of your organization. Everything that is left behind is the system. No one is indispensable in a perfect system. And uh, you see award-winning movies are director-based and not the actor-based. So hiring and training are very, very important. These are the two basic movers of the system. As I said about the distractions, learn to say no. Are you the best and what are you striving to let other people say that you are the best? So have a vision where you want to take your organization further. Uh, future and forecasting is again very important that again where you want to see. Succession planning is very important and 
how to select and groom the second end line in all sections, all verticals, and at the top. Uh, image building is very important. What kind of image you are going to create for your organization? The image may be bigger than the original. Some of the strong foundations required are ethos, fairness, honesty, ethical, and sincerity to the patient. You see, once you have all these, money will automatically come. Be seen, be present at the conferences, publish, read a lot of books, and of course, drill the key competencies into your team to give the best services to the patient. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Grewal. Uh, really, they are words of wisdom for all of us to understand all those things and be successful in your practice and establishing institution also. We'd like to invite Dr. Girish Rao. Uh, uh, he's going to, talk, going to talk about how to, you know, I don't know, how to improve the Premier Institute. They, we have to learn uh, to maintain and sustain and take the Premier Institute further uh, uh, in terms of the uh, national requirement wise. Dr. Girish Rao, please. Thank you, sir. So we've, we've heard uh, inspiring stories of uh, great institutions which have done human service to this uh, great nation over the years. And I shall briefly touch about what Shankar Netralia has been doing over the past four decades to maintain its status as one of the premier institutes in this field. And before I go into the uh, actual basics, I'd like to uh, take you through what's the Grenier's growth model, which uh, basically shows the time frame that a company or an organization goes through and the challenges that it faces. So on an x-axis of time, ax time on an y-axis of the increase in the uh, business model of any organization, you can put it as a company, a hospital, or any other uh, franchise, you have the various phases. The first phase is the phase of creativity. Then you have the direction, the delegation, the coordination, collaboration, alliance. So as the organization grows, as the time goes, you go through all these phases, and each phase has its own drivers and the naysayers. So when you go through the first phase, that's the creativity, it's basically a spark of an idea which pulls together a team, a young team, a very enthusiastic team, a robust team, which is very responsive and agile, and you get things moving much faster. But it's also a time when systems and processes are just about being set into places. And what is important at this stage is to have good communication. This is also a time when you need a, a good, strong leadership to... Uh, time management. Sure, sure. To, to, to take care of uh, the program. So as we go on, next phase is the stage of uh, directions where the organization then feels the need for hiring managers, decision-making and everything becomes more structured. You have the HR and the other processes in place and slowly a uh, culture, what Dr. Greval spoke about, comes into the aim. But also this is the time when you have verticals within the system and then there is a question of autonomy that comes in. And that's where then you go on to delegating uh, specific roles to specialists within the system. And then you also have factors like uh, accountability, the KPIs which come into the system. The leadership then starts looking externally. And uh, obviously, as I said, this is also the time when you need to rein in the uh, horse, which is trying to gallop in various directions. Then you come into the mature phase of an organization. That's where, as I said, all the processes set in, gel in uh, together. You have specific roles and responsibilities for each of these verticals. And that's when you have a lot of internal coordination. But also, that's what uh, the red tape here is. You should not have too many red tapism within the system for it to, for the people to express themselves and take this organization forward. Then you start looking at collaborations that where you look at uh, collaborations, both internal and external through alliances to take your business forward. And at this point, obviously, you need to take care of your own personal identity 
in a market which is uh, very competitive. So after decades of service, we are then presented with two choices, either evolve or repeat your successful model, evolve into something which is bigger or repeat something which you are within the comfort zone. So it said that if you want to do something you have never had, you have got to do something that you have never done before. So obviously, to succeed, you need to have a vision, you need to have the right people and the finance to go forward. So while we grew over the past four decades, we never lost root with our vision, that is to work with the missionary zeal and to provide equitable eye care to all sections of the society with compassion and without any discrimination. And all this, our focus was always to be a premium tertiary care institute, which try to provide this tertiary care at affordable cost. And I'm proud to say that Shankar Netrale, 30% of our uh, free services is specifically the tertiary care, be it the complex retinal surgeries, the cavalier transplants, the glaucoma surgeries, which are done absolutely free of cost across the system. And obviously to maintain that uh, edge in the tertiary care, you need to keep updating with the technology, be it the uh, heads up 3D visualization system or the state of art plexilate uh, OCT, which is, uh, which gives us the cutting edge uh, in uh, the tertiary care, be it in the cataract field with the femto cataracts, the wide angle viewing systems or the latest in uh, cataract technology. It's very important. That's what keeps the, uh, your manpower, especially consultants, glued to the system because they know that they are working with cutting edge technology, which gives them the platform to express themselves. And here, retention of manpower is very critical in uh, the system. Obviously, academic played a very important part for Shankar Netrale and we, uh, we are the first movers in terms of uh, optometry services. And uh, over the past, Three decades, we have more than um, 750 optometrists spread across the length and breadth of the country. Many of them are heading the optometry schools at various other organizations. And we are also proud that we have probably the highest PhDs, uh, optometrists, within our system at eight right now. And uh, also the need to identify and train the paramedical staff uh, so as to keep the manpower costs down as well as provide opportunities to the less privileged, led to the formation of these, uh, the Shankar Netrale Academy. And I'm proud to say that almost 50% of these uh, students are actually completely funded by the organization here. Many of them who are the first time uh, uh, college going uh, people within their uh, family. Obviously, EMR was the one which revolutionized our uh, care integrating technology, distance, so and uh, the people. So the EMR and the HMS helped get this data into a one big data, which has helped us in collaborating with the future uh, technologies. We have uh, also expanded to uh, specific areas of uh, tertiary care, be it the dry eye app, or the uh, super specialty work, which related to the ocular oncology, the retinopathy of prematurity, the uveitic clinics, or also collaborating with uh, other hospitals for their neurology, radiology, or the pediatric care. And um, very happy to say that uh, our ocular oncology, we probably have um, the only uh, tie-up where we are doing intra-arterial, intra-vitreal, and the intra uh, venous chemotherapy in our campus in collaboration with uh, some of the premier institutes like Apollo, just a minute more. We have also tried to integrate this technology to taking eye care to the doorsteps of the people through our SNDs. So for the elderly and for the uh, differently able, we now have eye care right at their home. And uh, the mobile eye surgical still remains uh, the uh, feather in the cap of Shankar Netrale. We have also had unique collaborations with various uh, universities, both within the country and outside. The, um, I would say the feather in our crown being the, uh, recognized as a center Can of excellence for ophthalmology. Sir? 
yeah. by the Department of uh, Medical Science and Technology with the IIT of Madras. So I think for the lack of time, I just wind up saying that there's only one growth strategy that is hard work. Remember, growth and comfort do not coexist. So it's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor is it the most intelligent. It's the one who is most adaptable to change. And that's what we all need to do to survive. Thank you. The next talk is ensuring growth over the decades at a premium institute. Dr. Girish Rao, please. It's managing group practice. Uh, it's a lovely group practice, uh, Netralem, that uh, Dr. Love, uh, Dr. Rupak, and all have built up. So, Dr. Love, eight minutes. Yes, sir. I'll, I'll be within the time. Okay. And uh, I'll rush through my sl uh, slides and as uh, dr shetty had uh, already told that we need to have mentors so all of us have it, this is a personalized thing and at different stages of our career and this is how i de exactly define our own practice which is a doctor group owned practice and it has uh, advantages of less capital expenditure best utilization of space it is the best earning potential for doctors, so we get the best uh, talents. All the specialties are there, and uh, that helps in excelling academically also. Risk, I would say the major risk is the risk of disintegration of team because such a high-performing uh, individuals under one roof, their chances of conflicts are more. And what I have observed that between 70 to, uh, 17 to 20 years, most of the group practice start disintegrating and we are the founder of this group practice. We are into our 19th year. So next two, three years, if we survive, then we are beyond that phase. Mm. And uh, solution is, again, we have to select the team with ut utmost caution because one bad apple may create a, a big problem for the whole team. And keep the communication channels uh, open le legally and ethically, which should be correct. System is fair and ha is same for the owners and non-owners. So this we started 10 years ago, which was our first center and it was a private limited company. And uh, two years back, we started the second center. So what is the uh, our model? Our is mainly a same culture group. All of us mostly are Shankar Nitralay trained. We all of us are first generation ophthalmologists. All of us are self-employed. We don't have salaried doctors. And uh, what we charge is our professional fee in OPD and OT. We don't charge for cross consultation. Company ownership is based on pre-decided percentages and uh, investment is proportionate to that. And what happens is what we earn is through professional charges, dividends, and when we exit. So when we started 10 years back, we started with a group of 10 consultants. And what you see now is a group of 40 consultants. And uh, mean uh, you see the growth in various areas in terms of infrastructure and manpower it is almost three to four times from what we had started and for the center the revenue is just 200 rupees for the opd diagnostics what we charge is 100 percent goes to the center and for ot the average ticket size for the center is 8500 to 9000 and this is what makes us unique. A center with such low income is sustaining and making profits. And reason being 40 consultants under one roof and all self-employed. That is most unique factor of our thing. Uh, our thing, concessions, we don't uh, consult. It is at consultant's discretion. Hospital doesn't uh, interfere with that. So that but, uh, one impression that is that we are a money minting machine. We are not because no patient goes untreated for lack of funds. Human resources, every consultant has a, a two to seven employee and uh, 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 high paying uh, hospital has almost 200 full time employees in which physician and, and, and our CEO are high paying and other are different categories. So gross revenue, what you see now is we are at almost, and it will have a lot of figures because it's economics of group practice and uh, we are generating around 43 crores, which is again, some part of it is excluded in that. 
and in that we have made uh, last year we have made a profit of uh, around 3.5 crores and till now we have paid almost 9.5 crores as dividend to promoters numbers we started with 7000 opd now we are at 92000 surgeries we are almost at 9000 so both are almost more than tenfold and uh, some graphs which will help us that this is the total profit and what you see is a dip during the covid times then we came with the second center and it started shooting up again valuation two way two way it has been done either as as a book value or ebitda into 10 that is how people in financial world value a company and this is regarding both the centers and opd numbers over the years the ot numbers over the years and uh, the injection number these are both the centers separately the small the blue line is the second center and uh, the green line is the first center so total combined injection number over the years and what you see this is the surgical conversion rate when we were small our surgical conversion was much higher close to 14% now we are at almost 9.5% so next comes the this is uh, one of the models what we are doing this is the uh, uh, optical revenue of both the centers and optical revenue is a good part because in the second center what we did was uh, with just with the optical and pharmacy revenue we were able to bring out the uh, rent of the whole building and risk management what we see here out of the 40 doctors 15 generate almost 90% of the revenue suppose even even if we lose the highest uh, proportionate doctor which is almost 13.37 that doesn't make the center very unstable so that way we are trying to de-risk it further the, the dependency on one particular doctor is much less and as you can see here the uh, revenue generation is most with the ot and diagnostic which account for almost 80 85% of the total revenue for the hospital in both the centers and liabilities we are we keep it very low it is a low risk model uh, low loan model so we are finishing up and uh, that that is how we stand at the end of two years our philosophy is ownership of doctors consultants our uh, strength no non medical uh, investors no pressure of emi that helps us in uh, uh, keeping the model correct so i'll end at that thank you thank you love for uh, savings yeah really running late and uh, ritika your challenge is 5 minutes my talk is largely philosophical uh, and it's applicable to everyone not just a second generation in a corporate hospital uh, i'll try and finish in 5 minutes uh, a corporate hospital is basically a system and i think what really makes an organization or a whole industry progress is when you think beyond a lifetime part of the problem of medicine the fact that we are not united as a group which we often say or is that we each of us think up to our lifetime and we sometimes don't think beyond johnson and johnson alcon etc they all think beyond a lifetime and the industry gets stronger and better aggregated so if we learn to live beyond a lifetime through not only our next generation or through other professionals who we pass on to the system to we create a legacy and that really helps the industry so can i so anyway i'll uh, i uh, i'll just share the philosophy i think i found a lot of gyan in mythology or the ancient indian wisdom which is not just uh, ancient it's actually eternal so who is the ceo of the world it is vishnu so vishnu ji has actually taught us how to run the world in different generations so he came to the world first as parshuram parshuram is the classic founder of any organization he is the disciplinarian all stories you hear about any organization the first person is the strongest disciplinarian he is the person who makes the rules who executes the rules who decides and who really is sometimes a little feared i'll just finish in 2 minutes sir it's just something that uh, 
minutes. I no, oh. it's not five minutes, it's sir. Five Please minutes. give her uh, some time. Some, it's fine. So Parshuram came as a disciplinarian. The next version was Ram. Ram had an unskilled army. He had an army of vanars. So he had to take all the decisions himself. He had to lead by example. His story is called the Ramayan. So the first generation attracts a lot of fame and a lot of individual identity. The third avatar, which is I think what the second generation needs to move to, is Krishna. Krishna always worked not for the rules, but for the vision. Because he had a skilled army. He had Yudhishthir, he had Arjun, so he could never tell them exactly what to do. Come at 9 a.m., go at 6 p.m. That wasn't his task. His task was to mentor, coach, and guide. And therefore, his epic is called the Mahabharata and the Bhagavad Gita. It is not known for him by name, unlike the Ramayana. So as an institution evolves and as leadership evolves, you move from being a Parshuram to a Ram to a Krishna. And the ultimate beauty is to create an institution that is sustainable without you. So you detach from the institution as Buddha and you move on to your journey. If, however, you feel that the institution you have created is not good for social reasons or parts of it are not good, you must turn into the Kalki and destroy the negative so that the positive persists. I'd also like to share two short stories about the role of the first generation. The first is that when Kalki comes back in the human avatar, the teacher of Kalki is Parshuram. So it is the first generation who always tra trains and passes on the legacy. The second is during Mahabharata, when the Pandas went to Hanuman, who's again a Chiranjeevi from the Ram age, they said, please fight with us. He said, I can't do that. It is your battle. But he said, I will sit on the chariot as a flag. So every time Arjun was hit by the bows of Karan, it was because Hanuman was sitting on his chariot that he did not move back. So the first generation is the shock absorber for the second generation. And here I'm not talking about generations by birth, but generations of professionals. So it is the first generation that nurtures the second generation. I'd just like to end by a quote, which I think Dr. S. Arvind said, and it really inspired me. Uh, he said that Dr. V threw a stone and created a waveform. You can be a propagation of that waveform, but you as a second generation or a second generation leader have another stone throw your stone, create a resonance of the waveform, and it is in the resonance of two different waveforms that the ultimate beauty lies. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ritika. We learn from the next generation. Huh. Sorry for the delay. Uh, thank you.